scale and fit appropriate institutions. So kind of building off the discussion we had with our, um, our history panel, we're going to talk about looking forward, how, what are some of the things, uh, immediate reforms that we can talk about and think about uh, in order to, to make a, a more appropriate uh, form of Navajo government. Um, our panelists include uh, Michaela Shirley, uh, Vincent Yazzi, and his brother John Yazzi. First on the, the schedule is Michaela, and, um, and uh, she's going to be talking about uh, the pot potential of using LGA for education reform. Um, uh, so, yeah, eh, Michaela Shirley, and she has a lot of people who are in the world, but she has a lot of people who are in the world. Um, and I want to also thank each and every one of you coming here today, hearing each of our ideas and how we're wanting to essentially transform our communities and our, and our, um, our nation. And I want to extend um, also an additional thank you to Andrew, um, willing to work with me, because this is a paper I have not written yet, but it's an, it's, I'm exploring it at the moment. Because um, currently I'm in the um, Masters in Community and Regional Planning program at the University of New Mexico. And my um, topic today is looking at the role of education in community development and how we could use the LGA to meet that, um, to answer that, answer issues around it. So I became very interested in this topic of linking community development and education because a couple years ago, um, my nephew, along with um, other classmates of his, were being labeled MRs, mentally retard. And this was said, this was said to them by their teacher um, for any time they had questions. What values inform the teacher, who is Navajo, to call her students MRs? I am not sure. But what is certain is how devastating the label can be for a young child. The responsibility of schools and chapter houses are to foster the positive reinforcements of good self-image, self-esteem, and confidence in the children so they can continue with their education and aspire to be members of their community and the nation. I talk about values because it's what's informing our Navajo culture, our identity, and worldview. The term for this that intrigued me five years ago when I attended Arizona State University is called indigenous planning. This was um, taught to me by my mentor, Dr. Ted Hohola, who is a member of the Isleta Pueblo in New Mexico. And essentially, it describes a value-based approach that is culturally um, appropriate and responsive to how the indigenous communities planned before Euro-Western planning was superimposed on us. My concentration in the CRP program is community development. And it's focused basically on local economic development, which looks at job creation opportunity, increasing social equity. It encourages local entrepreneurial efforts. Um, another thing is neighborhood community revitalization. And that's basically improving social cohesion, which is the relationships we have with our neighbors, our chapter leaders, our, um, our um, you know, school, Classmates, teachers, it's all those various levels of relationship that, you know, we interact with every day. Um, you know, it's looking at the community's needs and how they need to be met. Um, another facet of community development is looking at the allocations of community facilities and services. It could be including like schools, parks, health and social services. And in my opinion, it, which is informed by scholars like Ted Hohola, um, Deborah L. McCoy, and even my family members, is that quality of life 
is important in a community because it's a result of good community development. And essentially, and you know, a lot of a lot of scholars who are going to these institutions are essentially frustrated with how their communities are um, evolving into and what they are now. Um, you know, community development is meeting the needs of the community, and how is this done? It is done through engaging members in a meaningful dialogue about values, and in our case, it's values that are found in our Navajo culture, identity, and worldview. Poor community development results in a poor quality of life. Our Navajo communities are plagued with the following, alcoholism, drug use, vandalism, diabetes, height, blood pressure, famine, financial insecurity, unemployment, broken families, and suicide. Um, yeah, so none of these are actually informed by our values. So why are they persisting into our future? One way to address this dilemma is looking to using the LGA to empower the local chapter communities to, to be a part of their process, that's their, their planning process, and how they can do that is through schools. So it'll require each community to re-examine their past, or our past, present, and future Navajo educational system. It'll require building a consensus on the value of education in the community with intergenerational participation. And I say that because, you know, our elders have bad experience in boarding school. Um, I've had a, we've all had different experiences with how we were taught and whether it was, you know, positively or negatively reinforced. Um, and lastly, it'll require translating the value of education into principles for the Navajo educational system at a community level that needs to take place at the chapter. So it's a really brief presentation, again, because this is something I'm going to want to explore in my thesis, um, which is this year. <laughs> is, so like, I guess final thoughts is, you know, my hope through reevaluating education, we begin, we can begin to um, consider other measures of success other than Western-based achievement standards, like the tests that your children have to take every year. Um, chapter, house, chapter houses need to work with schools and schools need to work with chapter houses. At least the, in my community, which is in Kindathlachi, the extent of the collaborative efforts that are taking place between the chapter house and the school is voting for their school board and, um, you know, parent-teacher conferences. It needs to be more than that. And in order to do that, the chapter needs to be able to engage their communities, invite them and the school to talk about how they want their school to help create better communities for them. And for me, stable families and stable communities equals a stable future. This is possible, again, with a coordination between the chapter and the schools, because they need to groom strong leaders and healthier commu communities. So that's pretty much what I have so far in my process. And again, I'm really thankful that I was allowed this opportunity to talk about it. I'm also taking this time to also potentially establish networks and contacts who can help me further um, in my research interests. And yeah, yeah. Thank you, Michaela. That was um, right on time. Excellent. Um, again, we're going to we're going to as a commission, we're going to compile a report. Uh, take some of the papers and ideas submitted and, and have it available for, for the general public uh, after this conference is complete. Our next presentation is a dual presentation, uh, Vincent Yazi and John Yazi. Um, they will be talking about the, the Navajo Chizzy system, is that correct? Uh, leadership in advanced Navajo e-government and e-voting. It's really exciting. Um, I'm glad we were able to get this presentation. Uh, 
Uh, hello, my name is Vincent Yazi. I'm a Mexican clan, Akaidane, uh, Bipito, and my bitter water. It's, uh, and my Lugatane, and my father's side, and Tachini um, clan. Uh, I'm also from a relocatee from uh, Sand Springs, Arizona. Uh, topic is uh, Navajo leadership and advanced Navajo e, uh, e government. Uh, introduction. Tradi traditional Navajo government has evolved from a decentralized form of local leaders to the current top down government reflecting the U.S. trust relationship. Navajo leaders discuss problems and create solutions, but the U.S. trust agents reflect a top down government approach to solving problems. The top down approach has created the top down Navajo government. Navajos created headmen or local leaders to represent an area where the Apache choose, whereas the Apache choose leaders via experience and achievements. In 1909, Campbell and Gregor did a short reconnaissance in the Black Mesa coal field, followed by Gregor in 1917, which told the world the Navajos have coal. The Navajo Business Council was, was created in 1922 by the United States. Coal means big money, so the U.S. government started to pick Navajo rep representatives to speak for the coal resources via congressional law. The Indian Reorganization Act was, rep um, was created on June 18, 1934, which allowed an Indian tribe to create a constitution if they wanted one. Um, numerous powers given to the council via the U.S. government. Ultimately, a select few can control the council. The Secretary of Interior still has control of the council. Meanwhile, the Navajo Nation is slowly growing from the 1868 reservation with the addition of the 1934 reservations and other reservations. Uh, the Navajo justice system was subverted from local control to an adver adversarial game via the Court of Indians offenses in April 1883 by the United States. Later, healing has reverted back to the peacemaker. In 1989, the Navajo Council became extreme, and the Navajo government was reformed to a three-branch government, but still reflects a top-down government. More dialogue has to occur with the Navajo Nation Council via e-government and e-voting. Off-reservation Navajo must be allowed to run for tribal office if they live and work off the reservation. Uh, Navajo headmen. Now, Navajo headmen represent an uh, area for a group of Navajos and were utilized by the Spanish government, Mexican government, and the United States government for peace negotiations. Navajo signed treaties with New Spain in 1819 and 1822, uh, Harrison Lapahi website. Article 5 from New Ch uh, Spain Treaty of 1819. This chief and others of the bands will take care that their people plan and work to aid their subsistence. Agreed, giving thanks, heading New Spain Treaty, 1822. Agreement of peace with the Navajo Nation between the governor of the province of New Mexico, the principal leaders of aforesaid, and two headmen. U.S. treaties with the Navajos, 1849. Uh, Harrison Lapahi again, Ma Mario Martinez, head chief, and Chapiton, second chief, on part of the Navajo tribe of Indians. A Navajo Treaty, 1868, uh, uh, this is from uh, uh, NMSU, whereas the treaty was made and concluded at Fort Sumner, the territory of New Mexico, on the first day of June, in the year of our Lord, 1866, by and between Lieutenant General D. Tish Sherman and Samuel Tappan, commissioner on the part of the United States, and Barbon C. to Armijo and chiefs. And headmen of the Navajo tribe of Indians, a part of said Indians, and duly authorized thereby them which treaty is in the words and figures following to wit. Three countries have recognized the Navajo, Navajo headmen system for peace. Uh, Apache leadership. Young Apache boys were instructed how to survive in the wilderness, fighting and respect for the older leaders. To become adults, they had to be, have more instruction and participate in full raiding parties. Those having the greatest loot, minimal casualties, ability, and magnetism were selected as leaders rather than birth or wealth. That's uh, Robert Watt, Victorious Military Political Leadership of the Warm Springs Apaches. Uh, men with guns. Uh, guns arrived from Europe as muskets, very slow and inaccurate. Bows and arrows were more reliable. Later, the European firearms became more accurate. Repeating rifles and six shooters put the bow and arrow at a disadvantage. Finally, European firearms overwhelmed the Indians. Uh, cliff notes from the uh, European contacts. Um, Navajo energy minerals and creation of central government. This begins the top-down government. Uh, coal was reconned by Campbell and Gregor in 1909, and Gregor in 1917, and George Kirsch in 1952-54. to 54. Uh, Summary of the coal resources of the Black Mesa coal field, Arizona. In 1921, oil was discovered on Navajo land, and a centralized Navajo government was created by the United States government. Uh, this is from the uh, San Juan School District, uh, San Juan Heritage website. 
Uh, U.S. Secretary of Interior still has a hand in oil leases. Uh, 37, uh, this, this is actual from the NAP BIA. This lease and any modifications of or amendment to this lease shown that shall not be valid or binding upon either party. Hereto until approved by the Secretary. Under the Act of May 11, 1938, 52 Stat 34725 USC, Sections 396A through F, the United States government could lease mineral lands. Opinions of the Solicitor, June 11, 1946. Uh, recently, the, that's uh, Felix Cohen acting. Recently, the Navajo Nation can negotiate with energy companies there. Saw that on Harrison's little webpage. Uh, the Indian Reorganization Act was passed in June 18, 1934, but the Navajo Nation chose to ad not adopt a constitution, which was allowed. Uh, Navajo courts. Prior to the arrival of the Europeans, the Navajos at peace chiefs to maintain law and order were, were upstanding leaders of the community. At Bosco Redondo, 1863 to 1868, the U.S. Army created the village chiefs, 12 village chiefs, and bank, and the Fort Sumner commanders served to bring justice for the prison camp. After return from Bosco Redondo, the courts of Indian offenses were created in April 1883. Many traditional customs and protect practitioners were outlawed composed of three judges. In 1892, the Navajo Courts of Indian Offenses was created, which was conducted like a chapter house meeting, procedures, and Navajo custom. The 1934 Reorganization Act recognized the Navajo, uh, Native Courts. April 1st, 1959, the Court of Indian Offenses was done away with and replaced with the Navajo Nation Courts by the Navajo, K Navajo Nation Council to deal with civil and criminal matters. Navajo peacemaking now settles quite a few of the disputes now employing Navajo traditional custom. Navajo law has quite a journey, has come full circle. Uh, Robert Yazi, Chief Justice Emeritus, uh, the Navajo Nation website, the courts. Uh, Council Revolution, uh, 18, 1989, the central government started to evolve, which still had tremendous power. Power now could be concentrated to a few individuals, resulting in abuse. Council facing tremendous struggle to solve problems, Navajo land dispute, water rights, energy leasing. Navajo ethics was a concern at the Navajo Nation Summit Building Conference. Top-down approach is now paramount. Solutions now espoused from the top-down. Uh, Catherine Smith from Bay, Bay Mountain says, it would be hard for the young to return to fundamental law. Uh, Navajo e-government. Navajo e-democracy should rely on dialogue and collaboration as what was done in the past. One paper outlines collaborative stages and whole government approaches in using information technology. Uh, this is a whole government approach. Uh, these, these are papers from uh, overseas and in the United States. Obama created government transparency, but also like co collaboration like data.gov. There's all, all currently online voter registration in Arizona and Washington. Cost for voter registration per transaction is $8.43. Online voter registration reduced cost by 80 cents. Online voter registration is just as strong as paper transaction against fraud and has safeguards. The Venice government has ad uh, adapted bureaucracy to the internet via dialogue for their citizens rather than transparency. Bureaucracy creates secrets focused on transparency versus exposure, speed versus accuracy, external collaboration versus legitimacy, internal collaboration versus specialization, process versus network, agency competence versus policy necessities. The Venice people that led the internet adaptation said the following, quote, I don't, I don't like the word transparency, it's an obsolete term, and implies that there's someone who works and then has the goodness to inform citizens about the sense of his work. The internet web 2.0 platform allows dialogue. Dialogue takes place between peers, there's no place for someone who drives jealously hides secrets. Public administrations and citizens should dialogue at the same level. This is the real revolution, unquote. Secrets were considered a weakness in public administration. Transparency is now considered an outdated com concept as it only allows citizens to watch top-down government. Venice chose dialogue with its citizens. Homeland Security is afraid of e-government, especially online voting, and says ballot secrecy is a challenge. This, the United States still wants its citizens to live in a top-down government. Uh, one software I took a uh, look at was Big Pulse. It's called Online Voting Software, or Managed Service Online. Elections and voting, high security e-voting, found at htwww.bigpulse.com slash elections. From an email copy and paste, Big Pulse has the following features, first pass the post. Single transferable votes, STV, a form of preferential voting that produces proportional representation with multi-winner elections or instant runoff with a single winner. Preferential voting based on some nation of pre-assigned weights to each voter. Weighted cumulative voting 
often to use a corporate government and it, it, it enables voters to uh, assign different uh, portions of their total weight, the number of shares held to each candidate. You have been assigned uh, 1,000 shares for the uh, shareholder test in election poll number five. Uh, Sign-in links, authentication methods. Uh, uh, there's transparency vote uh, verification webpage. So online is uh, no longer a new tool, but it's now being used throughout the world. Uh, Navajo Nation candidate qualifications. I, I really had issues with this one. It, since I live off of the reservations, it's really hard to get back on because if you, you try to get a home slight lease and you run into unofficial kickbacks. It's monthly rent. After that is finding utilities and water for the house. There are many highly qualified Navajos living off reservation. These off -res uh, reservation candidate qualifications must be moved. This is for uh, Navajo elections. Navajo-NSN.gov slash qualifications.html. Conclusion, the Navajo Nation has moved from dialogue from among its citizens prior to the arrival of the Europeans through the Ke. Uh, American conquest created a top-down down government which has strained the current council. The Navajo courts has transformed from the peace chiefs to the three judges, Navajo Nation courts, and back to the peacemakers. Navajo Council has to break the top-down government and have more dialogue with the people as before. Navajo Nation information technology must be expanded for online voting, online voter registration, dialogue blogs, local, local chapter blog, chapter house voting, chapter house dialogue throughout the, uh, the world governments here. Throughout the whole world, the uh, governments here and there frown on top-down government and prefer dialogue with their citizens. Navajo Nation off-reservation candidate qualifica qualifications must be removed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yazi. Very, very intriguing presentation. Um, sharing sharing the, pre the other half of this presentation, the same titles, Brother John Yazi. Do you need to upload it? Uh, yes, I do. All right, uh, my name is John Yazi. Uh, I'm of the Mexican clan. My uh, father is the um, Lukat, the Ne'e clan. And then his father is uh, Tadich, or um, uh, Tachitni clan. Um, so my father is Tachitni clan, and then my mother's father is the uh, Bitterwater clan. But I'm the uh, Mexican clan, and currently I reside in Flagstaff, Arizona. So let me uh, get my file up. Okay, what I'm what I'm basically doing is just some base rehashing knowledge. But the idea is to develop the uh, person at a lower individual level, and. It takes the development of the individual and they go through stages of development before they attain uh, the leadership level of the chief. And so I call this um, um, uh, qualifications. Okay, right now I'm trying to link Navajo and Apache using the word uh, segundo, uh, which by definition is uh, second in command, the next to assume the mantle of leadership or second in a hierarchy of order. And, uh, and for the Apache, you know, there's uh, an Apache chief that was interviewed. His name was uh, Dakluchi. He indicated that the uh, Apache is usually a chief uh, chosen, or he, the chief chooses his uh, Segunda warrior whom he wishes to train as his successor. So there's an idea that, you know, you know that, that the chief can use someone or, you know, select someone to train. And I took that idea of Segundo because of uh, Manuelito had a son. In a particular photograph, he was called Manuelito Segundo. And his Navajo name apparently is uh, uh, Natasala. Uh, and uh, his picture is, uh, was taken in Washington, D.C. in 1874. So, to me, I'm just you know implying that there's possibly a um, a parallel in terms of uh, leadership development in terms of how the Apaches develop their leadership and possibly how a Navajo leadership development system might have happened. Um, right now, it seems like a lot has been destroyed uh, when during the fearing times in Huelte, 
uh, and especially when um, there was an emphasis not to go go to war. And so I don't. I'm trying to fill in gaps. Okay, so the leadership position uh, was open to individuals, and this also, for the Apaches, it also included females. Uh, in the Apaches, they had a woman named uh, Lawson who, uh, uh, who did go to the war with the Apaches or out into the field. And in the old Navajo, you know, women were known, you know, they were given names of warrior women. And this is to reflect uh, that they, apparently it does reflect that they did some fighting, you know, whether it was fighting to protect the home or if the home was attacked, they would join side by side with uh, whoever the, the local warriors were there to defend the home. So anyway, the, the, the leadership position was open to individuals who had, who had attained the status of, who had, the, who had attained the status of warrior. It was only the warriors that elected the chief of their tribe training to become a warrior started in childhood early, then late adolescence, and possibly reaching the title of chief in one's early 20s, which, which uh, in which case uh, Cochise had done. Uh, let's see here. Okay, leadership eligibility. Uh, before an Apache was eligible to be elected as a leader of his tribe, as a youth, he or she had to first attain the status of a warrior and this was a four-stage process. <clears throat> As a warrior, the potential leader had to demonstrate leadership skills at the family, community levels, as well as in warfare. So now I'm going to go to the four-stage process. Okay, come on. Okay, let me see here. What did I miss? Uh, where, okay. All right. One of the first steps is um, the, the concept of life or the philosophy of life called Inna. Uh, this, this philosophy forms the bedrock of how everything is moved or glued together. So understanding the greater philosophy of life because it will form an organizational basis of, of life experience. In Navajo, this life philosophy is called Inna forms and guides the youth's worldview. This is a circular uh, life-to-death model where an individual cultivates all the resources, knowledge, skills, and abilities to live a full life so that he or she can overcome life's challenges within the context of Kehoj and Hojon and, the, and in the context of uh, attaining balance and harmony. So what I mean is it's a circle of life from birth to death one has to develop all the skills that one needs to live life. And these are family, this is community, this is education, this means to defend yourself, this, you know, skills knowing how to deal with other people. And then, you know, as you get older, you know, you impart your knowledge to the young, the young help you, and then eventually you die, and then you have, um, um, you know, burials. Uh, but religious teachings are also part of this. Uh, the Jewish people have a similar concept that this same circle of life called Lahayim, but it's tied to the Judeo-Christian concept. And when you apply that idea of this cycle of life that everything is for resources, you, you, know, you can retain your culture like the Jewish people, like they did for thousands of years um, under persecutions. Okay, there's this thing called, uh, what I call power... So the Apache also had this same philosophy of life also. I mean, from the literature I was reading, I could not, f there was references to when they were attacked, you know, they would, um, boy, this stuff is, okay. Um, Dakluji conveyed that the Apache in war and peace also lived according to a similar life philosophy when he said, self-preservation is the first law of life. So that's to protect yourself. And then the second law of life was to uh, the perpetuation for the second law of life, which means, you know, get married, have kids, raise a family, you know, perpetuate that second law of life. This was illustrated when a camp was attacked. The mortally wounded counseled the able fighters not to worry about them, but to save those who would live. So, you know, this is how they would uh, perpetuate life, not to, if a person was dying, you know, forget about 
Forget about them. You, you hate to do it, but you have to protect the living to keep surviving. Okay, concept of power. Uh, power is, uh, I'm defining it as three, three, three things. Becoming aware of, of your connection to the supernatural force that pervades all living things. Then experience is one where a person must focus his mind to listening to the wind and avoid all secular distractions to the mind that prevent him or her from listening to the wind. Uh, listening to the wind is, like, I'm just going to use the word meditation. You know, you focus the mind. Okay, secular distractions keep the mind grounded in material things and cultivates the belief that the material existence is the only thing to live for. So, that's, you know, this is... Okay, power acquisition. Well, let me go to the... Okay, um, it's like meditation. I mean, I haven't found a... In Navajo, I haven't found a specific rite of passage, you know, that someone can go do what they call a, a vision quest uh, type event where someone uh, has peace and quiet, or, you know. But, I, but in the past... The elders would live through this by, you know, just being out in the wild or just being out herding sheep. Uh, singing can be a form of some place to focus your mind or pray, praying at the same time. Um, or, you know, learning chants and just, you know, singing the prayers. You know, when you do those, the mind focuses on these and then eventually, you know, something just clicks. Come on. I'm not even sure. Oh, okay. All right, power acquisition Apaches. Most medicine men acquire power when they are adolescents. Uh, they go alone to the sacred mountains to fast and pray for four days and nights. They take no food. Well, they do take water. Take no food. They take water or, or weapons. May have a blanket, but nothing else. Uh, may not, uh, and those that participate in this type of vision quest not all of them again attain this gift. The few who attain it, power, in various ways usually do not attain it until the last night. Okay, so what did I, I think I knew. So anyway, that last passage was from uh, Datluji himself when he mentioned this because he completed this process and he was the chief of the Chiricahuas in the 1950s. Okay, warship apprentice. Okay, um, the first two steps were the ones that, to me, were the most critical. And then this is just uh, what I call um, uh, what happens afterwards. Okay, a warrior apprentice, um, this individual must accompany the warriors on four raids as an apprentice. And essentially, they serve as a logistical function uh, for, to the warriors by displaying uh, forethought and humility. You know, they try to think ahead and address the needs of what the warriors might need. And um, they must keep up with the group, think ahead about what the warrior may need to be able to fight at a moment's notice and to take orders without uh, complaint. Um, and also, and I couldn't, I made a note here saying that I couldn't find the Navajo equivalent. Um, mainly, that's mainly because um, I've heard someone said that uh, sweat house ceremonies are now the equivalent I also think that maybe uh, hunting ceremonies may be part of that equivalent, too. Um, but for actual training of warriors, I don't know if that practice is still around. Okay, after participating in four war parties, then the certified warriors, the elders, okay, would, um, would allow... Okay, after four war parties, the apprentice would be voted in as a warrior if he was deemed uh, qualified by the warriors that he went out with. So that was the, the next step. And then after that, then he became a warrior. But, uh, but if he had greater aspirations to lead his people, he still has to demonstrate, you know, that, that his his leadership skills and organizing, conveying ideas to his people to face greater challenges. So he has to take all these ideas of what he learned about, uh, what is life, um, his uh, connection to the spiritual power, and, and, you know, meld all those and practice them, you know, 
you know, in life, you know, to, to you know, so he's work, you know, he's, he's problem, he's doing practical problem solvings, you know, and then if, and re re restraint, traits of leadership, different traits of leadership you can think of, he's trying to apply those. And the, so, if the, so, and at some point, let's say when the a chief dies, he can um, make a play for uh, uh, leadership. So if the social situation was appropriate and a person desired to become a leader, then he had to make that known. And it was other warriors who voted him in to be their leader. But even though he was a leader and he had a son, he may groom the son to be a leader, but if the son himself doesn't live up to some of these ideals of uh, uh, living according to uh, a life philosophy or he abuses or you might say poisons the, what the spirit the, the power of the spirit that he is work that is he's using, uh, they can say you know you're not fit, and so they'll not vote him in, but might vote somebody else in who displays better these better qualities. So it's it helps that your father um, put pit, um, puts his pitch in for you, but that's not a guarantee. It's how you live your life that uh, you know influences other people. So this idea of ina is what I think is one of the things that uh, a lot of the Navajo teachings have to be kind of plugged into. Because uh, one thing about ina is uh, like with money, you know, it's okay to, to make money, but it's another thing to live for the money, you know. Because once you live for something, you know, then it kind of destroys everything else because you're not living for life anymore, but you're living for this uh, money. And so that's one of the problems with the material world is that we tend to start living for the material things and not for things like family or community. So anyway, that's it. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Yazi and Mr. Yazi for your presentations, Michaela Shirley. Um, uh, as you can tell, this whole conversation is about uh, ideas of scale, appropriate fit. Um, we had a talk about the local governance and how, how community and education can be, re can, we can rethink through this, this question and then also uh, with electronic voting and, and uh, the potential in the future for electronic uh, uh, electronic democratic experience here on the, uh, within the Navajo Nation. So it's a, it's really actually a, an intriguing topic. We can think through that a little bit more. Yeah, um, uh, I've been thinking, sitting, listening this morning, trying to figure out, should I say this in... English, or should it be in Navajo? Either way, as much as I want everybody to hear, either way, somebody's going to not hear everything that I say. There's no winning in this world anymore. And we in a, in a month or so, we're going to vote for the lesser of two evils. That's probably what many of you are saying. But I don't mean to be such a pessimist. But uh, let me uh, <clears throat> give you uh, a sense of uh, what I'm hearing and what we just heard, the three presentations. Um, I mean, some of you are probably wondering, what, who, what the heck is he? Where is he from? And what is his qualification and all that? Well, um, my, my background is in sociology. And uh, so uh, I dabble in uh, psychology, and so I spent a lot of times doing that kind of, doing that kind of work. And so uh, 
I don't mean to say that I'm, that's, I have expertise in those areas. I just uh, dabble in so many different things that uh, I get myself involved in too many things and sometimes get myself into trouble. So I'm, my background is also in uh, policy. So um, we've heard numerous um, discussions this morning and most, most recently the first presentation you heard was talking about education in a community. I wondered, education in what community? What kind of community? The community we have right now, I can't speak in, to every one of you because I speak with one language and I can't speak two languages at the same time. That's the community we have right now. And that's probably the community that you have out there. Navajo Nation is just exactly that. What kind of community have we evolved into? How many of you just heard what I said? How many of you understood what I said? That's the community we're talking about. A community that is changing, that's who we are. Our sense of identity this morning, I heard, that's changing as well. As Navajo people in the 1920s or even before that, will we be speaking English? Would I be up here speaking English? No. I would be up here. I wouldn't even be here. I wouldn't be speaking before you. <laughs> That's what they say. We turn around and try to listen to our elders. What are our elders saying? This is our community. How many of you, if your elder is talking to you, you will hear every word they're saying? Probably not too many. It's going to be, in 20 years, less and less of you out there are going to be raising your hand if I ask you the same question. Why is that? And that's, what I'm, that's the point I'm making. We are in a community. Our community, the Navajo Nation, is changing so fast. So fast that the next, this current generation, they're the ones who are going to decide if we keep our language or not. And how many of you under 20 years old speak the language fluently? That's what I mean. You will determine whether we have a language. You will determine how we define culture. As Navajo people, then what becomes of us as Navajo people? We heard earlier this morning, if you are less than a quarter blood right now, you are not Navajo. Is that true? Who says yes? Hmm. I've heard this also. Meaning that person is not Navajo. And if you ask why, she will say this. And I'm posing it to you as something to think about. And we 
infer this when we talk about clans. If I came up here and I said, Am I Navajo? Now, if I said to you, Am I Navajo? No. That's see, that's what I mean. That's how we define who we are. That's a good point. She'll probably agree with me when I say that. But that's where we are. That is our community. So when we talk about governance, how we are going to interact within our communities, how are we going to relate to each other, how are we going to make decisions, that's the context in which we move forward on. Of course not. Who thinks that? Who agrees with that? Okay. Why do people say that? So there are many reasons why that's being asked of you. And that's why you hear that. Politics, I heard. It may have been true at the time when we talked about it. In other words, in the old days, a person was designated to lead this group. And oftentimes, there was warfare. So it meant designating this person to lead us where potentially we're going to be fighting to save our lives, where we'll be killing others, enemies. That's where the protection comes. That's what he calls it. We did that. That is where the idea comes from. It doesn't apply today. But the thinking still remains. Why is that? Why do we keep thinking that? Why do we use that as an excuse for why we can elect women as our leaders? We tend to stick to the old way of thinking, try to live in modern times. That doesn't work. We know that. These young folks are perfect examples of this divided way of thinking about things. Their parents have probably all speak Navajo. But they, do they all speak Navajo? We're in a changing community. We're in changing times. We have to recognize that. So let me say again about their government. So the context in which we operate in, we have to make a form of governance that is relevant to us in this modern time. But a governance is not something that you can just pull out of the sky or from the white man and say, this will work for us. Even if they say it's going to work for us, that doesn't work. It's like a relationship. Think about a relationship, those of you who are in relationships. When you meet someone, is that all there is to it? No. When you're married to someone, is that all there is to it? You're just a piece of paper and then you go to work? No. A relationship has to be maintained and sustained. It has to be nurtured. A government has to be maintained and nurtured for it to function. In a marriage, if one of you says, I give up, there goes the marriage, there goes the relationship. In a governance, if you say, nope, we're not gonna participate, what then happens to the government? It sits there by itself. 
On the other hand, the flip side of that is if one person decides he, she wants power and gets the power and is able to manipulate the government and the people, what happens? That's what we deal with. That is what I'm referring to as maintaining a relationship. And I'm hearing that. Top-down governance. There are so many forms of governance to talk about. We call ours a democracy. Is it really a democracy? Yes and no. And so when we talk about this, when we have these discussions about governance and leadership development, leadership development in the form of warrior development, I think that that's the same thing. In the old days, you prepared for war in so many different ways. You trained your young folks, young men in those ways. Today, how do we do it? These are, I think, our future leaders back here. They may not speak, they may not all speak Navajo, but they have ideas. These ideas that they're sharing with you. They have some ideas. It's something to consider, something to move forward with. And it's something to consult our people. You know, we, there's a re, uh, group of researchers that I worked with several years ago, and we talked a lot about how the government has to be relevant and appropriate to the kinds of the cultures of the people. And we've yet to find that. For as long as we have an outside and uh, Western imposed forms of governments that we establish for ourselves, we're going to struggle to make that relationship happen. But we're also going to have to create it in a way that is appropriate and relevant to who we are as a culture of people, to our changing community. And so whether it's top down, as I heard earlier, governance is usually approached in that way. Forms of government, if you want to talk about three branch, if you want to talk about parliamentary style, there's so many different ways to establish a government in which can, you can make it work. You have to make it work. That's how I'm seeing it. And so let me just uh, bring this to a close here. Um, I'm hearing a lot of uh, ideas. I'm hearing a lot of uh, suggestions. Let's listen to that. These are young leaders, uh, leaders of tomorrow. Is it playing itself out over there? Probably. So think about it. Think about these ideas. Think about the context in which we operate in. Think about our community. We're in a changing community. We're a changing environment. We're evolving. It's not going downhill. We are evolving. Evolving moves forward. That's what we do as a people. And so how we create a form of governance for ourselves down the road, it, sort of, it behooves us to listen to the young folks here. We need to move on that. And um, So I'm going to say more about this later this afternoon. But uh, I want to thank our uh, presenters from the, all the, uh, this morning, earlier. But uh, we need to keep thinking about it. Think about what is appropriate and what is a relevant form of governance that we need to impose or establish for ourselves. So, uh, and thank you for uh, allowing me to say a few words here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Begay. Um, the tragedy of this conference is that uh, each one of these presentations and talks and a lot of the points everyone's making could itself be its own uh, larger uh, point of discourse. We could talk about a lot of these issues for a longer amount of time and get into greater depth and detail about each of these.